I've tuned over a thousand turbocharged cars and there's two tricks I always use that novice tuners ignore. And ignoring them can cost you performance at best and at worst make your car a complete handful to drive. Right now there's a pretty good chance you're not unlocking the full potential of your turbo. But I'm not just talking about making more power, I'm talking about making that power controllable. And on a Group B rally legend like this Ford RS200, control is essential. In this video you'll learn how your turbo and wastegate work and you'll learn two techniques you can use to improve your power band while keeping your engine alive and to make your car easier to drive and faster. But you don't need a Group B rally car and a MoTeC ECU. These principles work regardless of your car, your ECU or turbo. Like I said, I use these techniques on every turbo car I tune. So let's dive deeper into what I mean. Electronic boost control is nothing new and if you own a turbo car then you probably have a reasonable idea of what it is and how it works, but most tuners aren't making the most out of it. In most cases, electronic boost control is used to control the wastegate in order to achieve your desired boost level and maybe even have multiple boost levels controlled off a switch or a knob. I'd call this level 1 boost control tuning, just the bare minimum. Let's take this a step further though. Have you noticed how the boost curve on most turbo cars tends to climb and peak at low RPM before starting to drop off as the RPM climbs? This is caused by the exhaust back pressure climbing with the RPM as the turbo becomes a restriction to exhaust flow. This helps to force the wastegate open, reducing the exhaust gas energy that drives the turbo, and the result is that the boost starts to drop away. With electronic boost control though, you can fix this, or at least reduce that boost drop off. Basically, we can shape the boost curve and that can be really powerful. I'd call this level 2 boost control tuning. Taking one step further, you can also bring throttle position into play, so you can then change the boost target in relation to both RPM and throttle position. You've now unlocked level 3, but I'm sure you're wondering why. Fair play, we'll see this in action, but first let's take a refresher on how a wastegate works. The turbocharger consists of a compressor wheel and a turbine wheel on a common shaft. Exhaust gas is directed through the exhaust housing causing the turbine wheel to spin. The more exhaust gas energy we supply, the faster the turbine spins. On the cold side, the compressor wheel is now spinning since it's attached to the common shaft. Air is now sucked into the compressor housing and compressed before making its way to the inlet manifold. Keeping this really simple, the faster the compressor wheel spins, the more boost pressure increases. There's a bit more to it than that, but for our purposes, that's all you need to know for now. If we installed a turbo system like this though, we'd almost certainly find that the boost pressure would be way higher than what we'd want, likely damaging both the engine and the turbo. So we need a way of controlling the turbo speed. That's where the wastegate comes in. These come in different sizes and shapes, plus there's internal and external versions, but again, let's just keep this simple. All you need to know is that the wastegate is an adjustable bypass around the turbine wheel for the exhaust gas, so that we can control the exhaust gas energy that we're supplying to the turbine. If we open the wastegate more, we bypass more exhaust gas and end up with lower turbo speed and hence less boost. Close the wastegate and we get more exhaust gas energy supplied to the turbine and of course more boost. If you want to delve deeper into anything I'm talking about here then we have online courses covering everything from EFI tuning through to mastering your boost control. Now let's look at two more scenarios where intelligent use of boost control can yield gains. In our first example, let's assume that we're tuning an engine that is known to have weak conrods, and if we want to keep these on the inside of the engine, we need to keep the engine torque to a maximum of around 300 pound foot. Torque is directly related to cylinder pressure, and this pressure can be one of the most common killers of your engine's internal components, so torque is often used as a safety barrier when tuning. To do this, we'd start with the lowest boost that the turbo and wastegate can generate and then slowly work our way up until we achieve the target torque. What we found is that that's about 1.3 bar and that gave us 303 pound foot of torque, but as part of this test, we set up the boost control as a fixed duty cycle to replicate a bare minimum setup. 
In other words, we're not going to try and chase the boost, and we can see that the boost drops off as the RPM climbs, getting down to about one bar by the 8,000 RPM red line. The end result is peak power of 356 wheel horsepower. Not bad, but let's see if we can improve this while still keeping the engine alive. Now, we're going to adjust the boost target throughout the rev range to try and keep our torque as close to 300 pound foot as we can. Unsurprisingly, we start with the same 1.3 bar, but by 8,000 RPM, we've now ramped the boost all the way up to 1.6 bar. This keeps our torque much closer to the target than our previous run. It's not perfect, but of course there's a limit to how much boost we can keep adding in. Since power is a function of torque and RPM, if we can make more torque at higher RPM than our first example, we're going to make more power and we can see that's exactly what we've got. A 51 horsepower increase without risking a Conrod failure. I think most people would want to take that gain if it was on offer and with this method it's not even difficult. Next, let's look at another trick that we can use that can really help make a turbo car much easier to drive and to control. It's most useful on powerful two-wheel drive cars, but it can transform the drivability of any turbo engine. When we're driving, we use the throttle to control the amount of torque the engine is delivering. More throttle equals more torque, which is all pretty obvious. In a naturally aspirated car, we tend to get a reasonable relationship between engine torque and throttle position. What I mean is that at full throttle, we have 100% of the torque available, but if we close the throttle halfway, we'll have closer to 50% of the torque. Again, this is overly simplified, but it's the concept that I want you to understand. Why this is important is that when the car breaks traction, we need to reduce torque to stop the wheel spin, and to do this effectively, we need the ability to accurately and quickly modulate the torque with the throttle. In simple terms, we want to know that if we close the throttle halfway, we're going to get a comparable reduction in engine torque. This makes it easier to drive and control a powerful engine right on the limit of traction. Things, however, are different in a turbo engine. So let's see how this works out on the Ford RS200. Let's assume we're not doing anything tricky with the wastegate to start with, and irrespective of throttle position, the boost target is fixed at 1.6 bar. We'll set our dyno to hold 5,000 RPM and go to full throttle, and once the boost reaches our target, we're making a little over 1,200 pound-foot of torque. Now, if that value sounds suspiciously high, that's because the dyno is now displaying the torque measured at the axle, which is multiplied by the gear ratio and final drive. Now, as I roll out of the throttle, we can see the torque barely changes and we're still seeing over 1100 pound-foot of torque at 50% throttle, where the engine is still making 1.5 bar of boost. Almost the same as when we were at full throttle. Hopefully you can join the dots here and figure out that this isn't going to be very easy to drive on the limit. But why does this happen? On a turbo engine, 50% throttle doesn't mean you're going to get 50% airflow. Since the wastegate is open to control the boost, it means that we've got more exhaust gas energy than the turbo needs. As the throttle is closed, the wastegate will also close to drive the turbo harder and try and target that same boost pressure. This can't go on forever, of course, and as we get down below about 30% throttle, we finally start to see the boost and torque drop away quite quickly. So let's see how we can improve this and at least get closer to the torque delivery of a naturally aspirated engine just with more torques. What we'll do now is add throttle position as an axis to our boost control table and start to reduce the boost target at lower throttle. The minimum boost we can target will still be set by the wastegate spring, so there is a limit to how low we can go, but it's still going to give a huge improvement. If we test again, we can see that we still achieve the same peak boost and torque at wide open throttle, but now when we close the throttle to 50%, the torque has dropped to about 750 pound foot and the boost has dropped to only 0.7 bar. Looking back at the first test, we've dropped the torque an extra 350 pound foot. The torque now follows your foot in a way that feels predictable. It's easier to drive on the limit of traction and easier to control wheel spin if we still go too far. That kind of control turns a handful into a weapon. Many high-powered turbo builds feel nervous because the boost control isn't giving the driver what they're asking for. So to wrap up, we've demonstrated how refining the boost control strategy completely changes the RS200's character. 
turning one of Group B's wildest machines into something completely predictable, confidence inspiring, and ultimately quicker when pushed to the limit. And remember, these same techniques can be applied to your very own turbo car.